Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. I actually spoke at a journalist forum maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, and I was trying to remember what it was about, and I couldn't remember. But I remember really having a good time and actually meeting a lot of people there that I'm still in touch with. Um, so uh, let's see. So yeah, so I, I have the unique privilege of, of chairing a committee over at the GSD. It's the Joint Center for Housing Faculty Advisory Committee. And so it's housed at the GSD, but it's, we, we basically try to build bridges between the Graduate School of Design, the world of design, and the world of the Joint Center, the world of housing policy. So I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna focus on the book, but I'm also gonna show uh, another initiative that I, that I had the, the fortune to work on in my capacity as someone who tries to build bridges between design and policy. Um, so, so we're gonna start, I'm gonna start by talking about this book, but I'm then, then I'm gonna talk about a design studio uh, that I did about housing in Los Angeles. Um, okay, so I, I, by, by the way, so I'm an urban planner, as Chris mentioned. I have a firm in New York called Interboro Partners. Um, and being an urban planner, what that means is I spend most of my time being yelled at by people who don't want their neighborhood to change. And they see me as someone who wants to ruin their neighborhood's uh, character or block their views or make it harder to park or whatever. And in fact, I often tell my urban planning students if they want to be liked, they should probably be a landscape uh, archi architect <laughs> because the landscape architects design parks and who doesn't love parks? I mean, think about, you know, people's opinions of, you know, Olmsted versus Robert Moses or something, right? Um, and of course, landscape architects do a lot more than just design parks, but, the but that's perception. So if you're going to be an urban planner, you're not going to be the most popular kid in the room. Um, so I want to give you some examples. I want to tell you about my week. So on Monday, I got word that a project I'm working on in a Midwestern city, an update of the city's development code was put on pause. One of our recommendations was to legalize multifamily construction in most parts of the city, including some neighborhoods that only allowed single family construction. Some people didn't like this. They got really angry at the city. They got angry at me. Uh, they made a big fuss about how the city's wasting money on consultants who are ruining the city. Um, they showed up in droves to a community meeting and used a lot of foul language. Uh, so the city decided to take a, a time out, put the project on pause. That same day, I had a, a community meeting for another project I'm working on. This one in a neighborhood, this one, this is a neighborhood plan. I'm working on for a relatively low density, transit rich neighborhood in a city with a wicked housing shortage. It's New York. Um, it's, in, it's in many uh, people's view an excellent place uh, to build the kind of dense, walkable, affordable housing that the city needs so badly. But presently, the idea is being challenged um, by a, a very active group of home, homeowners who showed, who showed up to this meeting, again in droves, they always show up in droves, to make the point that this neighborhood is and always has been a suburb. Um, and that if you're going to build, fine, but build nice big single-family houses with big lawns and two-car garages. Um, this was actually a very polite group. They, weren't, they didn't use foul language like the other one, but um, their message was clear. Prior to that, a community meeting about a downtown revitalization project I'm working on in a small, mostly rural community in upstate New York. People were wondering why there were so few businesses downtown. Why can't we have a coffee shop? Um, so we recommended that they prioritize building dense, walkable uh, housing downtown since more people equals more customers equals more incentive for someone to come in and open a coffee shop. Um, this did not fly at all. It didn't even crawl, never got anywhere, and they will not build new housing, and they'll likely not get a new coffee shop. Um, yesterday, um, I got a call from an environmentalist uh, friend of mine turned developer who's trying to build 16 passive homes on a small, in a small rural community. Um, despite scaling back the development, setting aside areas of land for conservation, and making dozens of other concessions to the concerned neighbors. He just got slapped with his third lawsuit, this one arguing that the development endangers an eagle habitat, creates runoff that will poison a, lo a local lake, displaces native, native plant species. I could go on and on. In my own community, um, I just got word that my town asked a local benefactor to uh, step up and purchase a parking lot that had just come on the market so that it wouldn't be sold to someone who would, you guessed it, build housing. Um, I could go on and on, right? These stories are not unique. Um, any, any practicing planner can tell you that. Um, NIMBYs are, are yesterday's problem. Ours is a era of bananas, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> and and igumfus. I got mine, F you. <laughs> housing is hated, housing is legal. No one seems to want to make any more of it, even though we all agree theoretically that we need it, right? So until recently, I, I walked away from these meetings angry. On the one hand, people just don't understand ur urban economics and trade-offs. 
yeah, you might have to park 10 feet away from your destination instead of five feet away. But the trade-off is that you'll have enough density for retail and public uh, transit and all the other stuff you said you wanted. On the other hand, you know, people are being selfish and they're being exclusionary and they don't understand the hardships that people <coughs> face. Right? Um, so I still do get, get, get angry, uh, but less so these days. And it's because I realized um, that when people think of change, if, when people think of, in this case, new housing, um, they summon the worst possible precedent of that housing, right? Um, that's the picture they have in their head. They assume that's what they're going to get. And in a way, who could blame them? The worst possible precedent is in some cases the most likely thing, right? Um, so we built some pretty terrible, uh, poorly designed housing here in the U.S. Uh, we've built it at every scale. So the point is, is that design matters. <laughs> uh, it matters a lot. We, I don't think we'd be in the situation we're in, ruled by bananas and igumfus. If the housing we designed was better, if people had a de different picture in their head when they, when they heard the word new housing. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we wrote this orange book that's on your table. Um, we, we wanted to show people that housing in this country can be designed well, that it can be sustainable and beautiful and create lots of co-benefits for everyone. So the, the, the housing projects uh, in this book all do that. So uh, we want the book to be useful to a lot of people. We, want to work in different ways. We, we hope that our students, we hope to see it on the desks of our students. Um, but for me, this book is, is for sure coming with me to uh, community meetings, looking forward to taking it around and showing people that um, better housing design is possible. So yeah, the book is called The State of Housing Design. Um, and what, you know, from the intro, what is the state of housing design in the US? What trends can we discern in the design of single and multifamily housing, how are architects re responding to the warming climate, the housing shortage and ensuing affordability crisis and other major built environment related challenges. So broadly speaking in the book, our uh, focus was on new novel, notable projects. Um, the our, our criteria for inclusion was not ever really strictly defined, but it was um, kind of cooperatively negotiated among our editorial team, which included practicing architects, urban planners and designers and economists. Six graduate students in the Harvard Graduate School of Design's MRC program, also MUP program, and DDES programs. So uh, I think we each had our own ideas about uh, what, what, what should count. We all came to the table with different um, nominations. Um, we did establish some criteria. So uh, we wanted to include only projects that were fully built, built and occupied in the last three years. Um, so much of what gets discussed over at the design school is purely theoretical. And there's a value to that, of course. Um, but that's not what we, we were interested here. Uh, everything located in the, in the U.S. Um, and uh, we wanted to pick projects that confront one, one or more of the built environment related challenges of the day. I think Chris outlined them, right? So we, we, we also wanted to look at projects that were kind of in, um, in dialogue and found meaning ways, meaningful ways to respond to things like enhanced guidelines for accessibility or resiliency and increased uh, resident and community demands. So we see design as a dialogue and we see good design and good projects not just kind of doing their own thing. If you've seen, you know, the Fountainhead, we're not looking for the future Howard Rourke's of the, of the world where you blow up the building if it's, you know, if it's not made, made exactly to your, your, your standards. Um, so anyway, so I, I think, so uh, a lot of different residential types are included, but what's not included are like standalone single family ha house, houses, the ones that you know, adorn the pages of some of the glossier architectural publications. Um, you don't see those in this report at all. So the report is organized. Um, so here's, here's just a, you know, an index. You can, you can, we can y'all have this, you can flip through it. In the end, there's an index of all the projects that are included. And uh, here you see the table of contents, and it's actually organized around 25 themes that are prevalent in housing design today. So these uh, really emerge from the projects. Um, we kind of looked at our list of you know projects that, that were on our radar, and uh, we, we we attempted to discern themes. Um, they're not all they're not all created equally. So some of them the one, some of them that have names next to them are sort of longer pieces, and we turned to journalists. Actually, it was a very er early editorial decision. We were thinking, who, who's going to write this content? Would it be architects? Would it be historians? Would it be economists? No, it's going to be journalists. People actually know how to write, <laughs> and, and they're not going to make our, our you know, editing, not, not going to create too much trouble for us editing. So we had some terrific um, journalists who contributed um, nine of the 25, uh, essays for nine of the 25 themes. 
Um, so there's a, it's a couple of other things to highlight. There's a survey. So the book starts with a survey we conducted with over 1,300 uh, people. And uh, there's a lot of noise in it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, differences of opinions uh, flourished. I will say that uh, for a lot of folks, uh, like I think building code and uh, construction codes um, zoning, these things came up time, time and time again as impediments to the design of good housing. Uh, there are a lot of drawings in the book, so each of the major themes ends with site plans, as you, as you can see here, of the different, different projects that are included in the chapter for some kind of apples-to-apples apples comparisons. So you see this is just some of the floor plans from some of the projects in the Creative Corridors theme. Um, so, but then we also um, have these kind of smaller themes, which all have unique, unique drawings. So, like you know, one of the smaller themes is about pitch roofs. It's there's this you know trend around um, these 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 kind of uh, uh, pitch roofs. You see it in a lot of a lot of residential architecture. So, this is just a quick drawing showing some of the some of the pick projects that are in the book, and the you know the angles of their different pitch roofs and things. So, you know, it can it can be playful. Um, but the but but overall, it's a pretty pretty serious message that we need we need better housing. Um, so I thought I would just maybe take you through a, a theme or two, to give you a sense of what we're talking about. So just disguise density is one of the main themes, and we had an essay by Mimi Zeger, who I guess is not here, but was here yesterday. Um, and so from our editorial introduction on the topic on the left. Quote, not enough housing is being built across the country, period. Housing density is still far below what could be supported by local infrastructure in most opportunity areas. However, accompanying increases in height, street frontage, and building agglomerations can clash with collective perceptions of neighborhood character. Disguised density refers to a design strategy that many projects use to obfuscate their unit count with architectural moves that fit more closely with established local residential topology. So the essay, again, is by Mimi Zeger, who underlines the point that this tactic is a good solution, but maybe for a problem that shouldn't exist, right? Quote, that new development must slip quietly into a neighborhood underlines a long-held entitlement of home ownership and the bias of single-family zoning. Uh, so she highlights a bunch of projects, and I think a bunch of them are in Los Angeles, and actually a bunch of them follow Los Angeles's small lot subdivision ordinance, which was touted as a solution, um, as a way to add, add affordability. It basically reduces the setbacks that, that you need and lets you build on smaller lot sizes. So the, the project on the top left um, is, by, is a project called The Blackbirds. It's by Bar uh, Bester Architecture. And here's Mimi's description. Quote, Bester drew inspiration from the modest single family homes and occasional low rise courtyard apartment buildings that line Echo Park's hilly streets. Named the Blackbirds, Bester's Complex combines these two topologies to organize a series of duplexes and triplexes around a central parking court. Each building stealthily resembles a single family home. The design uses pitch roofs and other exterior paint color to break up the bulk of larger volumes. So new construction blends into the surrounding scale. Um, the project at the bottom um, is by Lorcan O'Herlihy. Another, uh, actually I had an opportunity to tour both of these uh, buildings with, with my students last year. Um, and uh, they're both really, really wonderful projects. So here's Mimi on this project. The authors of the ordinance, the small, the, the small lot subdivision ordinance, recognize that increased density and potentially bulky massing indicative of multifamily housing would set off alarms. So a series of design guidelines dictates specific arch arch articulations of facades, entryways, and roof lines to present blank and boxy edifices ill-suited to the surrounding context. At Canyon Drive, each unit has its own unique identity. So the architect, Lorcan, in, 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 inflected the roofs at the townhouses so that each facade resembles a mid-century modern A-frame perched atop a garage podium. Um, yeah. There's a lot of other examples in this chapter, but again, I just want to give, I don't have too much time, so I'm just going to give a, going to kind of fly through this. Um, another theme is the new era of amenity. So from the editorial introduction on the left, with increasing pressure on the public sector to employ all measures to expand the supply of affordable housing, municipalities are looking to leverage more value out of underused public land. This has led to new and, and interesting developments that mix housing with typically standalone public service buildings. One aspect of the strategy is co-location, 
which conceptually pairs programs that work for a specific resident group, such as seniors, and a chosen public amenity, such as after-school care. By coupling social infrastructure with housing, these projects expand the typological imagination for public land beyond other housing proposals that use air rights or remediation strategies to capture value. The best projects push pairings of residences and amenities beyond mere adjacency and into an active partnership. So the essay is by Nate Berg. Nate, are you here? Not here. Um, and uh, so he writes, uh, quote, the approach of fusing community amenities and housing is catching on. So he writes about the independence apartments in Chicago, which you see on the right there. Uh, it's in the Irving Park neighborhood. It contains 44 subsidized affordable apartments available specifically to seniors. Um, it has a, also a light-filled two-story library and a shared courtyard in the back. The project was a product of a desire to build ambitious 21st century libraries, as Nate writes. Quote, in late 2016, then Mayor Rahm Emanuel proposed a unique solution. The library would uh, be able to realize its 21st century library by joining forces with partners who could access the funding to get stuff built, housing developers, by coupling new projects, federally subsidized affordable apartment buildings with libraries co-located on the same site, or even within the same building, the city could get more housing and the library system could get more out of the ambitious libraries it envisioned. So this is a project by... Uh, John Ronan Architects in Chicago, and it's really nice, nicely done. Actually, I'd noticed, I just flew into Chicago on Tuesday, and I, if you fly into Midway, you go right by it. I didn't even, it was a surprise. Um, but uh, so uh, it, it, he writes about the architecture. It stacks and segments the two parts of the six-story building. The concrete and glass library is pulled up to the property line on a busy street, and the bright gray four-story apartment block for low-income seniors sits further back. Colorfully accented windows uh, which is another one of our many themes, actually. Um, it's a trend. Uh, they pop out from the apartment's corrugated metal facade and full-height windows line both lengths of the library, pouring natural light into a reading room with an impressive 40-foot high ceiling. Um, I want people to walking into that library to feel important and to feel this uh, this is an important institution. And actually, Nate it concludes with a, a quote from a resident, which I thought was really great. Wendy Jo Harmston was one of the project's first residents, and she has no plans to leave. A voracious reader, Harmston, says she checks out three or four books a week from the library and uses its computer. She knows the staff there and resides in the building, um, and, she, uh, and she can usually be found downstairs in the reading room. I rarely miss a day, she says. Okay. That's so what I've got, like, just a couple minutes left. I'm going to just go through some of this stuff pretty quickly. So um, adaptive renovations. Great stuff there. Okay, I want. I mentioned that that I'm gonna um, I'm, that I wanted to just talk quickly about another initiative that I that I did with 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 my um, as, as a chair of this committee that tries to build bridges between design and policy. Uh, so this is not about the book. This is a studio I did. So at the GSD, we teach studios. We we get 12 students. They use planners, architects, you know, landscape architects, and we pick a project uh, to work on. So. Um, I decided to do a, a studio uh, along with the Joint Center about uh, the future of housing in Los Angeles. No, you know, just small little uh, brief like that. So, um, you know, and here this is just from the presentation I made to the students. You know, there is, as everyone knows, a housing shortage. Los Angeles, like most cities in the U.S., doesn't build enough housing to keep up with demand, a fact that has contributed to what is arguably the worst affordable housing crisis in the country and a homeless epidemic. And so to address this, uh, California charged the city with a seemingly impossible task zone for 255,000 new homes or forfeit billions of dollars in federal housing grants. It seems like an impossible task because, I mean, where are you going to put 255,000 homes? It's not like there's a lot of vacant land in Los Angeles. Um, for sure, there are parts of the city that aren't so dense and maybe can be upzoned and infilled, but upzoning them is difficult and contentious, as I've mentioned. Um, banana, there you go. So, um, so you got to be creative, right? I mean, I, upzoning and infilling is obviously critical, but you also have to be creative when it comes to site selection. Golf courses, highways, shopping centers, high schools, universities, airports, container ports, industrial zones, oil fields, parking lots, <laughs> cemeteries, not cemeteries, but... I mean, I, don't, I didn't want them to get that creative, although I did have one student who started down this road and I <laughs> steered him away from it. Um, but it's, it's obviously it's not, a, it's not just a quantity problem, right? It's, it's a, 
Uh, the challenge, daunting as it is, presents an opportunity to really reimagine how the city houses its residents. So in the brief for low-rise housing ideas for Los Angeles, a competition that we looked at closely, Christopher Hawthorne, who organized this uh, conference, writes that, quote, for much of the 20th century in Los Angeles, architectural experimentation focused on the same location, the single family house. It was in the realm of the standalone single family residence that Los Angeles essentially defined its own version of the American dream, sun dappled, forward looking uh, with a private garden. That dream needs an update. Uh, Los Angeles is segregated, unequal, it's hardly sustainable, so the single family house has a lot to do with it. So that was a big theme of the class. So I asked students to sort of think creatively about sites, but also think outside the box when it comes to uh, different housing and development topologies. So we looked at a range of examples, many of them which actually are in, in that orange book. And, um, you know, we looked at a lot of uh, traditional topologies done well. Um, also, a lot of these are in the books. Uh, so, so the brief was basically that we wanted to figure out uh, where we were going to put 255,000 units of new housing. That was the brief of the class. And the idea was to basically to build blank on blank using blank with blank. Okay. <laughs> so, like, you know, it could be building community land trusts in single family neighborhoods <laughs> using the, you know, single lot ordinance or whatever. Um, so students kind of mixed and matched from these different columns to create different ways to do housing. Um, so we started out uh, basically making research on the what, where, how, and who. So students had to make these kind of cards that allowed for apples to apples comparisons across different building types, um, land use types, pro-housing policies, and then stakeholders. And um, armed with this research, I actually asked students to make board games about the politics of building housing in Los Angeles. Um, so here, here's our review. Uh, here's all of us playing board games uh, over in Gun Hall. And they were really remarkable. Students actually made these in three weeks. It was just a warm-up ac activity. GSC students, they make stuff fast. And they're <laughs> it's pretty amazing to watch. Um, but I think, I think making games is a good way to get students to think about the politics of the built environment. There's trade-offs, there's, you know, powers that you have and, um, and, and stuff. So like this one was about, uh, you know, a, a kind of zero-sum game between developers and um, com a community that wanted to preserve their community. Um, it, it was, you know, there's a lot of like Gimby versus NIMBY games and stuff, but it was pretty fun and interesting. But um, anyway, so we, we, start, we started there. We took a trip to Los Angeles, and we met with um, everybody who would meet with us, developers, architects, activists, planners. Um, and uh, we, these are all the folks that we heard from, so including Lorkin, who you just saw some of his buildings there. Um, and we, we learned a lot and got really confused, <laughs> like really confused. <laughs> um, but uh, here we are on our first day. And then on our last day, actually in front of Canyon Drive Apartments, that, that Lorcan project that I just showed. Um, but uh, they had to spend the bulk of the semester, you know, making this kind of mad lib proposition um, to build X on Y using Z with N and get, and get to work. So basically, this is, this is from the final review. This is what students ended up proposing. Um, so students looked at strip malls and big boxes and golf courses and... Uh, you know, power line rights of way. And in fact, we made this, this map. We wanted to show the universe of sites. And that might be good for building housing. You know, from, uh, so, you know, we could look at, one student looked at highway buffers. You know, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but wanted to look creative. Students wanted to look creatively about how to, how to design unique things, but that were also prototypical. Because we're looking for a scale here. Um, and in fact, one of, one of the people we met with in Los Angeles said, you got to think of things in terms of batch processing. I know you're design students, you want to make these bespoke designs that are one-offs, but the scale of the problem is so huge that you really have to think about if you're going to build next to a highway, how do you, what are some rules that you can embed in that that would make it prototypical, right, and repeatable? Um, another student looked at power line rights of way um, because there's this, this is unbelievable to me, this, is, this whole strip is just a power line that could easily be buried runs through some really great neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And so she made this really interesting proposal, just imagining if you had this kind of linear city in the, in the right of way of the power lines, if you just buried the power lines. Um, another student who looked at big box, building on top of big box stores. Uh, another student looked at building over highways. Another student looked at parking lots, uh, you know, golf courses. 
This is like a prototypical golf course development that a student did, which is great. Gas stations. You know, gas stations actually all have the same dimensions for the most part, so you could really think about a prototypical approach. We're not going to have gas stations forever. But again, these maps are looking at the, the universe. In other words, all the gas stations in Los Angeles. And, right? um, so those are kind of quantifiable. La lastly, I'll just say the, the last thing students were asked to do was make a promotional for, for their um, project because Los Angeles has this wonderful tradition of like advertising for you know, the, the bungalow courtyard and the, the towers at Park La Brea. So students basically made these promotionals that were public facing. A lot of work that students do is critic facing. Um, but I said, you know, take your golf course development, give it a cool name, Home on the Range, <laughs> uh, and, and try to sell it to, to, to the public, right, to, to think about that. Um, so that's, well, I should stop talking. It's been 25 minutes. Anyway, um, I'm happy to take some questions and comments. Yes. Uh, Josh Stevens, California Planning Development Report. How did you choose LA as your as your site for this project? <laughs> and do you feel like anything you learned about LA is in keeping with your spirit transferable to other cities? Yeah, I picked LA because I just it's my favorite city and I love it and. Um, I just love going there, and I just think it's super interesting, and I just happen to know a lot of people there. A lot of my, my teachers were from Los Angeles, and uh, so I, combination of, of, of those two factors, I just, and, and I think the affordability crisis is particularly sinister there. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for design there because it grew out as much as it can. It's got to grow up, and so um, I, I just think it's, I think it's more interesting too than like doing doing this in New York. There's something just there's so the housing topologies are so diverse, um, and there's just a lot more experimentation I think you could do, and also um, students love going to Los Angeles, <laughs> and I wanted to have a popular class. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to be honest, and I do think yeah, absolutely. I think we learn so much that's replicable. I mean, one of the things we learn there. Is like a lot of the, a lot of the progress, in terms of like um, uh, is coming from the state level, because you've got all these local you've got all these like local council people and elected officials who maybe maybe want like want to like shake things up and build some housing, in their neighborhoods, but they know that if they go on record supporting housing, they're going to get voted out of office. So what happens is the state basically comes in and like has these regulations like the SB rule and. Um, you know, and, and, and or to make it as of right that you could convert, you know, uh, offices or whatever to make it easier to build, get rid of parking restrictions, all these things that you probably know about. And the elected officials could be like, well, I don't, this is terrible. Well, but what am I going to do about it? It's coming from the state. <laughs> so they could stay in power, get their housing and pretend like, you know, that they don't support it. And I, so I think that there's a there's kind of a lesson there that there's there's probably you know, I'm, I'm not like, I don't know, I, I think maybe there's a replicable lesson there. I mean, we tried it in New York, right? And I mean, in, I live in New York, and Hochul came out with a, with a pretty ambitious housing plan that went nowhere, so it's obviously not the, it's obviously complicated, but that's one lesson that I think we learned. <coughs> yeah, Henry. Um, oh. Oh. <clears throat> These projects are really beautiful, so that's your students. Um, this, uh, what do you make of the, um, the uh, conflict or apparent conflict between the pursuit of good design and the involvement of local design activists who are often the ones shaping the aesthetics of the project? And I think there's a feeling that not only does that create uh, enormous delays, uh, often finishes with fewer units, and then finally produces a design that seems to be um, kind of rounded down uh, sanded down along its edges towards something that looks like, I think, what we now know is like the gentrification building, which is like yeah. broken up masses, 10 different materials on the facade. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think everybody, every architect we talked to talked about like how broke the system is and how it results in that building you just described because all the, all the projects we looked at were involved some form of subsidy, and obviously each subsidy comes with strings attached, right? And, and so these buildings end up kind of looking alike because they all draw from a lot of the same subsidies. Um, 
and it's it's a real challenge. And I, I feel like a lot of the architects that we talk to, there was a, there was a sense like this is there's something broken. It's like, uh, uh, and uh, we were led. So somebody said um, the problem is is that we we put too many ornaments on the Christmas tree, and the Christmas tree can't stand up anymore. Like, of course, of course, we want union labor. Of course, we want like, yes. you know, everything to be. Uh, lead certified. Of course, we want like 100% ADA accessibility. Of course, we want to like have facades that like blend, blend in with the neighborhood. I mean, uh, you could go on and on, right? But like, you, of course, you want to have uh, you want to retain the stormwater uh, on site. But like, you add all that up, and you get to where you are now, where it costs what $800,000 for one unit of housing right now on average to build in in Los Angeles. Um, and so there was a sense that like we 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 have to. Think of start thinking more along the lines of trade-offs, right? And we have to start thinking like, maybe we can't have it all. <laughs> th th I'm, I'm not saying I necessarily agree, although I kind of do. But that's what we heard. That's what we heard from from every single architect. Like it's just, it's 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 it, the system is just totally broken, and it results in, you know, the expense of, the expense, but also the the how long it takes to construct anything. I mean, these buildings take three four years to build, and a lot of everyone had stories about like. The problem is, is like every every like subsidy has this rule, and then there's always like some ins some different inspector from some different department has to come, and like you, it's impossible to schedule them. And I mean, it, you sound like a Republican talking about this because it's like <laughs> regulation and big government. That's the problem. Um, but but clearly there is some problem with that. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I guess like so what should we do? Should we get rid of all the visual um, like? Uh, design review boards, community involvement in the design, all that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I agree, I agree with Chris. Like, 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 that kind of reform, just zoning reform and stuff, is, like, not going to solve everything, but it's, it's an important step. And I think, you know, there's communities have just weaponized, I mean, we know it's like a lot of the games were about that. It's just like how communities are able to weaponize, you know, CEQA and, and historic preservation and, like, uh, this whole town all of a sudden is a mountain lion, lion preserve. How about that? Like, <laughs> um, right? And so there's something wrong. I mean, I, we, we all agree to a certain amount of community control, but it's community control is out of control. So Dan, um, I'm wondering, where does this work go now? And um, the reason I'm asking is because I'm supposed to be meeting with La Casa, which is the LA County Affordable Housing Task Force that yeah. is all, and, and we've been working with a lot of jurisdictions in California who now have to create a housing element required now by the state. Yeah. And um, has, has this, is this work available to them to actually think about their housing elements? Is it something that I could share with La Casa in, in January to talk about what's possible? So, yeah, there's going to be another book. It won't be orange, it'll be blue, and it'll have all this stuff in it. Um, it's almost done, but it's not done yet. I mean, if you if you really if there's any aspect of this that you want to share, um, I'm happy to like give you some slides or some like draft materials. But uh, we worked with the city uh, city planning in Los Angeles, so um, Vince Bertoni and 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 his folks um, took an interest in this, and so they're eager, eagerly, hopefully eagerly, await, <laughs> awaiting us putting all this stuff in a in a publication that can be shared. These aren't shovel-ready ideas, but I think that the, the idea is, the hope is that this stuff will re resonate with, with folks. Um, yeah. So. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm a writer and planner, and it's so always like I'm having those conversations, too. Uh, and, and the design provocation, like we need good design for our buildings. It can't just be ugly five-over-ones. Really interested in like that, that idea of pushing things forward. Uh, Boston has the the triple decker, a naturally affordable housing typology. Uh, are you seeing any any buildings, any type forms you can talk about that that might be uh, the one for the twenty first century? It depends on where where you are, you know. What about for like LA for urban infill development? Um, yeah, I think uh, LA has such a rich tradition of like you know. Um, four plexes and um, and bungalow bungalow courtyards. Like I, ultimately, like I believe in vernacular architecture and trying to make nods to history. So I'm a big fan of the bungalow court. I'm a big fan of the the fourplex in Los Angeles. Um, you know, Los Angeles even has a tradition of towers. I mean, if you go to Park La Brea or um, 
I'm forgetting the, the name. There's there's a couple other ones. Um, I think so there's a there's a really good book um, that someone put out that's about multifam the history of multifamily housing in Los Angeles, just trying to get people away from the idea that Los Angeles only means like you know that that American dream of a single family house. And uh, what's her name? Uh, she, she has a podcast in Los Angeles about how. Say it again. Yeah, Franz Anderton. I highly recommend her book. That's chock full of like really good uh, architectural topologies that are worth worth uh, rethinking. Um, I also want to say, um, you know, Mac and I a couple weeks ago uh, had a chat about manufactured housing, which I'm really bullish on right now. <laughs> in manufactured housing communities. I don't think it's necessarily an answer for Los Angeles, um, but I did I did make the point at our conference yesterday that I think it's a overlooked, underappreciated topology that uh, never comes up in conversation at the design school. Um, even though the it's still the cheapest thing to build, the new ones are energy efficient, they're super flexible, you can arrange them in all kinds of ways that actually achieve high levels of density. Um, you know, there's a whole trend now around resident-owned communities, which is really exciting. Um, so I'm, I, I couldn't answer a question about topologies without making a pitch for my my new my new favorite topology, <laughs> the resident uh, you know the resident owned uh, manufactured home community, which I think Probably. is yeah absolutely we should be thinking about. And I know that the Lincoln Center is doing a lot of important work there. Okay, I'm getting the hook here. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's a perfect segue because we are indeed going to talk a little bit about manufactured homes uh, later today. Okay, uh, Dan Dioka, uh, Harvard University Graduate School of Design, in partnership with the Joint. Center for Housing Studies, thank you. Thank you, thanks so much. Yeah.